my name is Sarah Alexander, and um, I'm uh, I work at the as a senior advisor at the Selco Foundation. Um, my role sort of cuts across um, various verticals that we work with at the foundation, but primarily my uh, focus is on the Global Hubs program, which looks at taking the India learnings that we have um, and seeing what is adaptable, replicable, and can be contextualized in global contexts. Um, I also looking at uh, our impact investment portfolio, which is around patient capital and how do we get kind of monies to uh, last mile energy enterprises. Yeah, I, you know, I think we're all reeling from um, it's sort of the elephant in the room that you can't avoid uh, these days, which is COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic, I think, was was so horrible in, in many ways, but it also played a role, I think, in shining a light on the relevance and the criticality of decentralized renewable energy. You know, for too long, I think, you know, we we needed a stark reminder. I think that something was very broken in our energy systems and the way that we were sort of tackling poverty and, and maybe looking at it from a very technology centric point of view, looking at it from a very one dimensional point of view without recognizing that um, there are multi dimensional um, lens through which you have to see poverty, right? Um, whether that's from a habitat perspective, uh, the kind of spaces people live in, whether that's from a nutritional food security perspective, um, you know, whether that's from a digital or education perspective, you know, there, there are different ways they can be looked at. And but I think all that happens is that uh, the poor are often left without any sort of safety net. Um, and what they're left to grappling with is trying to find ways in which they can just survive from one next. Um, and the first sign of any stress or shock quickly like kind of spirals them back um, into poverty. Uh, you know, there's a figure that's floating around that about 120 million people have been pushed back into poverty as a result of COVID. Um, and, and that is a stock you know, kind of statistic to tell you that, you know, something was very wrong in our system. If, if it took something like this to remind people that, um, you know, a lot of people are in very vulnerable positions. What we did see in our work was that the, the ability to own solutions, to own the energy through which you're able to power your livelihoods, um, your education or your healthcare was sort of a lifeline for many, uh, for many people. The more remote, the more uh, you know, further away you are from any kind of centralized, um, you know, grid or hub activity, the more vulnerable you become. And yet, decentralization, uh, decentralized solutions, um, offered a way for people to sort of be, um, you know, to to own the asset, to own the energy that they produce, as well as to have control on its reliability and after sales service and maintenance uh, that were being catered to by local energy companies. Um, again energy companies who were again decentralized in their supply chains so you know were able to sort of source material inventory from local guys or local suppliers who um, they had you know long-term partnerships with so you did see sort of a championing of decentralization in many ways of you know whether you want to call it that 100 mile radius or whatever but the but the ability to, to kind of look at um, you know solutions from a um, you know within a certain boundary or within a certain scope um, I think when you think of mountain communities, I think the first thing that pops up into your mind is sort of, you know, climate change and sort of the vulnerable position they're in in terms of the terrain that they operate, uh, that they usually live in. It's it's quite susceptible, um, you know, to to you know ice melts, you know, glacier melts, uh, you know, different sorts of, uh, you know, the way you look at large scale energy projects, you know, it sort of you know also has. Uh, an impact on the local ecosystem um, that is available, the very delicate ecosystem that's available in those regions. Again, decentralized renewable energy, because renewable energy in itself can also be, um, I think, have its evils if it's not uh, implemented in the right manner. You can still have a large solar power plant causing water issues, um, you know, just because of an amount of water you need to water, water panels. So I think we need to think of, you know, de de 
but are closer or proximate to the end user, thereby making, um, you know, having lesser of an impact on um, it's their surroundings or, you know, their dependability on, you know, exogenous factors for it to actually function in our work. Um, so, yes, I think there is a relevance and there is a criticality. Um, and, and, and I think that is fairly obvious um, and it was a, a light shown on it as a result of the pandemic. Um, I think one recognition um, that we have is that, you know, we've often said that the poor is not, they're not a homogeneous group, right? That um, I think you have to consider like, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, it's not just one lump sum of people. I mean, they are broken up into tiers um, and various dimensions of vulnerability indexes of what poverty means. And what that what that throws up is that the kinds of value chains, commodities, or you know, um, relevant livelihoods in their context also varies. Um, so in certain communities, it might be, uh, you know, dairy might be more prominent, fisheries might be more prominent, um, whereas in others, it might be horticultural um, sort of uh, value chains that are of more relevance. So I think understanding at the first point, understanding what are sort of the local contexts what is the local end user context? What is what are the lo local social capital structures in place? I think is a very important pre-step to any implementation. When I mean social capital, I'm saying even things like what are their local sort of collective structures? You know, um, you know, how do they band together? Is there a cooperative sort of structure that exists? Um, is there a village council? Um, are there SHG groups? Um, you know, do they have they dealt with uh, an ownership of an asset before? Is it more an individual based system versus a collective system? Um, what has been their access to credit um, in these places? How does credit actually flow into these communities? Is it a barter system? Um, which is not very, you know, uncommon in, in mountain regions, or is it a cash-based system? So I think recognizing those kinds of needs and recognizing that one size does not fit all is sort of the first step to that. Um, and then I think what we then move into is sort of understanding, you know, what kinds of value chains, um, you know, make sense for them. And therefore, we look at it right from the the production stage all the way to the processing stage, we look at what are the energy nodal points um, in a value chain that makes sense to an end user. Um, so if it's dairy, for example, um, you know, right from uh, chaff cutters for um, the uh, for the cattle, or whether it's uh, milking machines for, for you know to to actually produce the milk, whether it's um, you know, milk chilling machines for the storage of the transportation all the way to processing machines, um, you know, for, uh, you know, to convert that milk into, you know, a product that can be sold at a retail level. I think we try to understand what kind of machinery is there, you know, what kind, what is available on the market, what maybe needs to be created new. How do you look at efficiency of the system? How do you look, is there a grid connection or do we look at solar powering it? Um, you know, and, and, and are there local organizations that can actually manufacture and deliver these solutions and provide after sales service? So there's a lot of, um, I think, thought that goes in the pre-stage, the during and the post stage to make sure there's a continuity and sustainability to it. An important aspect that we tend to focus on as well is understanding um, you know, financial structures. So people's ability to pay, the availability of capital in the area, the financial infrastructure to be able to do this. Um, that's another sort of lens in which we come in to try and understand, uh, you know, who is responsible or, or, you know, what kind of ecosystem exists and therefore what part needs to be plugged in uh, more than the other. I mean, one thing that we often say here, there's no point in capacitating people or financiers, for example, if there isn't a pipeline of demand and supply um, for that demand from local energy entrepreneurs. Um, so I think those kinds of, you know, push and pull of ecosystem factors is what we really sort of try to understand and facilitate to bring the right people into the picture. Um, you know, I think one thing is, um, you know, whenever, you know, I think there's a framework with which we work with, right, which is the ecosystem lens we've been talking about. Um, and I think what we really try to understand when we go into one region or the other is, is sort of just understand the lay of the land. 
you know, who are the partners there, you know, what is the maturity of ecosystem, what is the local infrastructure that exists, uh, social, financial, you know, technology, capital sort of thing. Um, I think, I think that recognizing that yes, such an approach is needed, but understanding that when you go into a new region, you're able to sort of not go in trying to superimpose something that we, I mean, I think the biggest mistake we would make is going in and saying, oh, well, you know, in India, we do it like this. So, you know, this should be the same case in, in Nepal or in Tanzania. No, I think it's recognizing that those countries have a certain maturity of their ecosystem. So what kind, what piece of the puzzle is well developed, what piece of the uh, puzzle is underdeveloped, that is as far as the ecosystem factors are concerned, and who are the existing players that are doing this, how do we work with them, or how do we create new programs? I think that sort of um, thinking is critical as a stepping stone or the foundation of your understanding, I think, before we do this. The, the other way is, I think, you know, we strongly believe in just getting down to doing implementation in a lot of these um, regional countries. As much as one talks about the ecosystem approach, about this interlinkage, and, and I think those are all great for your first year or second year, maybe the first two years of your program. But after that, I think one really has to kickstart the implementation side of things, actually putting things on the ground, demonstration pilots, really sort of kickstarting um, you know, identifying, you know, where is it that the bottlenecks occur? You know, if supply is a problem for local energy enterprises for, say, a livelihood product, you know, why is that? You know, is it duties? Is it uh, the availability of spare parts, um, you know, when something breaks down? You know, I think trying to understand those chain of, um, you know, of, of, of components that are required to be able to deploy a solution is sort of critical to, to whatever we're doing. So, so yes, I think that if to, to be able to replicate and implement, I think getting a sense of the maturity of the ecosystem, who are the existing players, and recognizing that one has to immediately get down and start implementing locally with local partners is sort of a prerequisite or a key to um, sort of ensuring any program you know, you bring life to that program. Um, I think that for us at Selco, we recognize that there are certain processes which are, you can, you know, they're ready to replicate as is, you know, maybe a certain type of financing model, maybe a certain type of technology. You don't have to do too much tweaking and modification to it. It is ready to be implemented as is. But then you might have another set of, um, um, you know, issues, or you might have another set of processes that needs to be adapted or modified based on the local context. And then you might have to have like 10% of your program completely new. Um, it's, it's totally fresh. Um, you may need to really think of it from, you know, ground zero. And I think that sort of, you know, what is, what can you replicate? What can you adapt? What is new? I think that combination of things is what really goes into a scale up or a replication program. But I feel like with all the experience in the world, I, I don't think we're starting at ground zero. I think there is enough knowledge and learning um, that I think we need to be better at being more efficient about very fresh, precious philanthropy money to make sure we're not making reinventing the wheel, re, you know, and, and sort of repeating the same mistakes, but really learning from it and building off that to kind of move, um, you know, in, into the next stage for other countries.